Chester Gay Collection. <clears throat> uh, this book right here is called Pages Passed from Hand to Hand, the Hidden Tradition of Homosexual Literature in English from 1748 to 1914. Hmm. So kind of the long 19th century and longer. <laughs> um, and it's this anthology edited by these two guys who are both gay authors. And it has everything from Walt Whitman to uh, Herman Melville, all these these folks. And I, I wanted to show you this first because um, there has been this sort of literary tradition of uh, homosexuality uh, in the written word, which has been sort of uh, on the down low for a good long time. Um, so my story with this and the story of this starts out with this advertisement, which was in the Rochester uh, University of Rochester Campus Times. And a under wanted summer sublet for three girls and above tape recorder, four track stereo, <laughs> was this ad that said, take heart, brothers, gay lib is coming. Hmm. And this was in 1970, mm -hmm. so a year after the Stonewall riots. And what ended up happening is that this building right here, which is Todd Union on the University of Rochester campus, became the home uh, with a little office, a little campus office of these fellows and a couple of ladies too. This was the foundation of the Gay Liberation Front, which was a national organization. And so this was a chapter of that. And all of these folks decided that they needed to start meeting and, and really start to take liberation seriously in the Rochester area. And uh, these are all some photos from this one guy who snapped them and collected them and kept them. And I know some of these people because some of these folks are still alive. Mm -hmm. uh, this mm -hmm. guy down here uh, looking this direction, that's Michael Robertson. Uh, this fellow here, Tim Maines, unfortunately has passed away. But this guy up at the top there in the red striped shirt is a guy named Whitey LeBlanc. Mm. It was a very small group of people, but curiously, two students came over from the Eastman School campus to the River campus. And one of them was this lady right here, Karen Hagberg. And this is in her former home, which is on my street. She was my neighbor for a little bit. Oh. And she lived next door to the other Eastman student who had been part of the group, a guy named R.J. Alcala. And they started to uh, show up in parks. Here, they, look at that really groovy T-shirt. <laughs> and they started to uh, document their activities. And R.J. Alcala is the guy who named this the empty closet and this is the original person who named it that is a still alive and he used mm. to live on my street cool. which is cool here here it is it's like a it's like a it's an early xerox it's not even a <laughs> we have some mimeographed issues later that were just one page yeah. but this one was like huh. january 1971 oh. and if you take a look here's some of the pages inside uh you know gay power that symbol of the fist with the different, you know, um, symbols of, you know, manhood, womanhood. Uh, you know, they reprinted things like this thing from Ann Landers. So this is a photocopy from the newspaper, but it was an article about, you know, it was, a, it was a reader asking Ann Landers about their child, you know, and, 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 and being she, gay. How did she answer? <laughs> she said... Uh, oh, it's about someone bringing their uh, their, their their significant other to a a, a party. Mm -hmm. I'm tired of living a lie, and I want to tell the chairman of this year's Christmas party that I'd like to bring my wife, who happens to be a male. If the chairman doesn't like it, I won't go. Do you recommend the move? And the, they, you know how they always sign themselves with, with a funny zero hour <laughs> dear zero if you want to lose your cover go ahead but figure in advance what you're going to do for an encore and just have another job lined up just in case oh, wow. i know i know there's an article in here about a poet allen ginsburg which is pretty cool yeah so there's the but if you notice on the left hand side of this page it talks about the cornell gay liberation front so these were things that were popping up on campuses and how did the schools respond, Jerry? Was, well, was it just kind of part of the 70s? It was part of the 70s thing, the anti-Vietnam War, the women's movement. Um, 
Uh, it was it was a little bit after the the main thrust of the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. but there was still a lot of black power stuff happening around 1970 as well, and the school seemed to be okay with it until mm -hmm. <laughs> and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit until almost everyone that was part of the group graduated, uh -huh. and so there it it was like it wasn't really so much of a student group anymore. Uh, and so uh, the university asked them to leave. But I wanted to show you this page here because if you notice from the get-go, the GLF bookshelf. Oh. And here are a bunch of citations with annotations mm -hmm. of the things that were on the shelf. Huh. And uh, yeah, uh, the boys of, Bo of Boise, which we still have a copy of. Tea Room Trade. So some of these were kind of oh. sexy things. Uh, <laughs> The Lord Won't Mind by Gordon Merrick. Ah. Uh, yeah. Uh, here is a book that is from the Gay Liberation Front Library, and you can see the stamp here. So this is actually from 1971, 72. Some people have checked it out. I think that they have. Or, or, that's um, not a checkout list there, though. Yeah, no, this says, this is my call number, rare. <laughs> <laughs> because it's... You know, one of the things we do is anything that's before 1975, we pretty much put in rare. But it's amazing how many citations oh, wow. are I must in this. Yes, you know, you're right. I'm rare. You're not very rare. <laughs> so, I yeah. I graduated high school in 70. I'm not even rare. I was five years old in 70. <laughs> so, but from the very first issue of their, you know, kind of club newsletter, they were talking about their book collection, which uh -huh. I think is pretty cool. There was a dance. There's the Ginsburg thing. Um, the, you know, the A Liberation Front schedule. And it talks about how they were going to meet up on October 1st of that year with the members of the Rochester, Ithaca, and Buffalo homophile groups. And we'll talk about what those are in a little bit. The Five Freedoms, Power to the People, bam. The Empty Closet started really reporting a lot on their activities. And what a headline. Here is that actual issue. Oh, wow. wow. No the way they wow. did it was they folded it so that it could sit in like a magazine rack oh, or it sit on a shelf in a magazine rack. Whereas when you opened it up, that's, that's how Very this was. Deep. And they did that for years and years and years. But New York Parade <laughs> climaxes. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, and by this point, which was 19, let's see. What? 1974, they were the Gay Alliance. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened to go from the Gay Liberation Front to the Gay Alliance is that there was some gay drama. No <laughs> kidding. <Shocker>. Yes. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> no, it, it happens. So the boys and the girls were not getting along, uh -huh. and they split up. Yeah. And the women yeah. actually moved to Monroe Avenue, and the boys moved to a free, unheated warehouse space in the Bull's Head neighborhood, which has been t since torn down. And after a winter of no heat, and after realizing that they needed to come together as lesbians and gay people, they got together and formed the Gay Alliance of the Genesee Valley. And so how did they manage to resolve that? I don't know exactly how they did. I think it, it may have just been practical issues. Like, sure. you know, there's heat in your space. And there's heat in ours. <laughs> I, know. I, know that sounds, I know that sounds, you know, but you know what? You need, yeah. So look at this photo. of the, 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 the wow. This was the Christopher Street Liberation wow. Parade, which became the New York uh, uh, Pride Parade. And mm -hmm. it, it happened a year after Stonewall. There was a parade to commemorate Stonewall. And you know, Stonewall is right the, on that street. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's the corner of Christopher and I, whatever, like fifth, eighth, sixth, seventh. You maybe you know, it's like in the middle of the island yeah, there. I saw a thing you know. on TV yeah. About that. And he, here's a funny thing. This guy, this guy on the left, oh. had gone to Nebraska, and, and when he was traveling around the country, and realized it was a gay community there. And he was from Rochester. He was part of the GLF, but he was there for a couple of years. And then there were some other, these are some other guys from Rochester wearing their gay wearing love shirt. shirt. Yeah. 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 And then here is a guy on the right hand side, and he's wearing the lambda symbol. And the guy that he's talking to is Dr. Benjamin Spock. Oh, 
Oh, yeah. wow. Do you yeah. know who that is? Oh, yeah. oh, okay. I just want to make sure. It's not, not it's not, guys. it's not that Spock. <laughs> it's the other, <laughs> it's the other Spock. Yeah, um, I, I was a pediatrician, so he was oh, a yeah. big star. Oh, yeah, he was a big deal. He yeah. was a big deal. Yeah. And then here are some young ladies who were also in New York City at the time. And over the decades, mm -hmm. the empty closet, you know, just kept going. It, w it became a monthly publication. Here I am in 1980. <laughs> uh, no, it's a guy named Vern Hall and Sue Cowell. And Sue uh, was a lesbian activist who yeah. later became the... Uh, president of AIDS Rochester okay. and then became the president of the Gay Alliance for a while too. Mm -hmm. uh, so she was an activist. She was one, she was, they, they hatched up the idea for AIDS Rochester on her porch just, just a few mm -hmm. years after this, which is cool. Uh, and let's see, let's take a look at what the, what the headline here was. What March on Albany. Say? This is April, 1980. So this is just before, uh, AIDS was discovered and the and the, the HIV virus and you know for a while it was called GRID, uh, gay related immunodeficiency. Mm -hmm. This I, yeah, I don't yeah. think I knew that. Yeah, for like a couple months and then they oh, decided okay, sure. to call it uh, to sort of remove the gay part yeah. and because it was also called gay cancer, yeah. um, and uh, they decided to make it a little bit more generic, if you will, and call it. Acquired immune yeah, I was in San Francisco in the early 80s. Oh, it was it really pro probably hit. rough, yeah. And yeah. I know that this issue from 1986 was would have been right in the thick of it, you know? Yeah. Um, but you'll see here there's this uh, thing about Tim Maines being sworn into office, and we'll talk about him in just a bit, too. Um, but it says, New York State's oldest gay newspaper, even then, because it really became not just a newsletter for a club of people that were gay, but a newspaper. Because what ended up happening in Rochester is there was suddenly this proliferation of gay bars and mm -hmm. gay bathhouses and activities. Mm -hmm. This is much later. This is from 1995. Mm -hmm. And this is the third uh, Rochester Lesbian Gay Film Festival, which became what's known as Image Out now. And Image Out just celebrated its 30th anniversary last year. Mm -hmm. So it's been around for a long time. Which is pretty cool. Oh yeah, this is like these are like the pink pages that you would see in the advocate, <laughs> the sex, the sexy stuff. You know, yeah. Film festival runs from um, October twentieth to October twenty eighth, and that's a long festival. And I'll tell you, it's actually still ten days, and they still do a festival in the spring. There's going to be a. Who do they hold it? They hold it at a couple different theaters. Yeah. Uh, in the past, it was really three theaters. It was the Cinema Theater, the Dryden Theater at the George Eastman Museum, yeah. and the Little Theater. Right. But lately, it's just been Little and Dryden, mm -hmm. which is totally fine. You know, yeah, it's great. Here is uh, an issue from two thousand and one, uh, and this is one that this guy was kicked out of the Boy Scouts uh, mm -hmm. as a scout mm -hmm. leader for being gay, and he came and spoke. Uh, and then they had like a second, a second, second section for holiday shopping guy, <laughs> which is kind of cool. And then as we move into the the twenty, you know, I guess it was 2018, 2017, it became more of a monthly magazine. Mm -hmm. And with color and events and stuff. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool, pretty cool. Is, is that by subscription? Or well, are, are at the moment, it's not or? being published. It was free. It was, uh, it was uh, okay. you know, on news. To, you know, you could find a pile of it, like a, a coffee shop. Or it, all the gay bars had piles of it. And then <sighs> people did get it as a subscription. They would pay for it to get mm -hmm. it come in the mail. In this sweet envelope. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. Um, but since the alliance has had some issues, both with COVID and with financial stuff, the, the publication of The Empty Closet has actually ceased, oh. uh, for, at least for now. You know, these one, the, I think the most recent one was March of 2020, which is when a lot of things stopped. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, but I did want to let you know. So this is one of the newer ones here on the screen. That uh, that there was an agreement made with the Rochester uh, University River Campus to digitize issues of the empty closet wow. because the alliance owned the copyright on these. They we had an agreement and they were microfilmed, which is kind of cool too. And there are copies of the microfilm at our office at 
the River Campus and at Cornell University in their human sexuality collection. But you can look at past issues and they have them on a, a platform called Issue, I-S-S-U. And you can just scroll through and mm. th they're, they're like super high resolution PDFs. And what, you know, this used to be done by hand layout. Right. And then they started using a, 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 a Mac computer and they started using pages. And so what, what we started to do after a certain point is that, is that they just sent them like PDFs of the files. Mm -hmm. And so they were going directly from the files as opposed to from the microfilm. Mm -hmm. you know? There was like a cutoff date for the microfilm. Oh, that's your mom. There you go. Say hi. <laughs> Anywho, um, I wanted to show you uh, uh, this photograph of an early gay pride march. You know, whenever a town has a community center or a, a, a group of people and they have pride, there's always a debate about whether or not it's a march or is it a parade. And as you yeah. can see right here, this was a march, <laughs> you know, fight back and gay oppression, you know. And then, of course, over the years, it has become sort of both. And it's, you know, if a business has enough gay people, they will march in the parade and they will wear their, you know, T-shirts. And, you know, for instance, here is from like five or six years ago, maybe a little bit, maybe 10 years ago. Th that lady on the right, that's Sue Cowell, mm -hmm. the winner. And the guy in the, in the middle is Tom Ferrarisi, who was the president of the board at the time and was also the Monroe County elections officer huh. for the Democratic Party. There was a wow. Republican and a Democrat. So that was kind of a cool. Wow. And here's our, here's our gay band. At this point, they were called... They're basically troublemakers, and now they're called the Rochester, I think they're called the Flower City Pride Band. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and I, you know, since we're in this religious situation, <laughs> I wanted to show this, this Presbyterian. <laughs> it's, a pres it's a very Presbyterian song. It, it really is. By the grace of God, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. It's, it, it's practically tulip. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Totally. <laughs> um, you know what? What what ended up happening is that, is that the gay community center started to be the organizer of a bunch of these events, you know. And pride became a thing like where there was a, an event at city hall with a flag and a kickoff, and you can see there were news cameras and everything. Um, and so, uh, but it's only been in the last decade that the the gay community center actually ran the pride parade. It used to be run by a separate organization called the Business Forum. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that the community center ran was the picnic. Mm -hmm. And this picnic started out very early. I want to say 1973. Wow. Um, you can tell by how short his shorts are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, tall his sneakers Yes, are. exactly. <laughs> and they're not tied that well. So that was the look. I would have had a crush on him. I, what is this? He, his, his shirt says, rightfully proud. So this may yeah. this may even be like an early '80s yes. picture, yeah. um, but the community picnic actually started almost like spontaneously, where a bunch of people were like, "We should just ha we should just get together. Let's get together," and uh, they contacted a bar and they said, "Hey, we're going to have a picnic for gay people. Would you uh, supply the the beer, you know, or booze?" And they're like, "Sure." Well, so many people showed up because it was probably advertised in the empty closet that the bar actually had to send people back to the bar from the park to get more booze, which was amazing. And it happened in July. And as such, what that does for Rochester is it orients our pride celebration in July. Now, in most of the Northeast June is Pride Month because that's the month that the Stonewall Riot happened. And in New York City, it's always like that weekend around it. And even in Toronto, it's usually at the end of June, maybe the very start of July. But other places, their Pride celebrations are totally different times. It's just that around here, people think it's weird. You know, why is it in July? And it's always, it's like, well, it's because of the picnic. It's because of the picnic. And the picnic was a big deal. And, mm -hmm. and a, 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 you know, just hundreds of people would come to the picnic mm -hmm. and just walk around. And you would just, you would like walk around and just talk to people and see people you hadn't seen in a while. 
and they also have uh, the where they were doing the picnic in the park. They had a, a rotunda, like a giant gazebo, and it was big enough for people to have a a, a dance in there. So there were DJs, oh, wow. uh, you know, people brought their dogs. I mean, it was just it was right near the river, so it was like super nice. It was super cool, but that's like a thing, you know, that that the uh, the picnic became a very important community event, and it was put on by the gay community center. It was put on by the GAGV. And where it was is the gay. Where is the community center? Well, I'll talk about that because it, it's it, it started out here after when they got back together. And this is an old fire station. It's actually two fire stations put together. Mm -hmm. And if you go in there, you can still see the fire poles. There's mm -hmm. one on either side. And these used to be the doors where the fire trucks would come out. Now it's not so old that it was like a horse-drawn thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. but it's still pretty old. And this is, you know, the now the mid nineteen seventies. It had been transformed into this multi-use situation. Uh, and when I say multi-use, I, I zoom in on this picture. You can see all these different things, oh, yeah. and it became pretty hippy and oh, pretty yeah. dippy. Yeah. You know, good company, general store, peace and justice education center, holistic health education center. I hope they were pottery. nice to each other. Obviously. Pottery. Obviously. And Cricket Press. <laughs> uh, the, the, those two things are the things that actually survived in this building. The, the, the pottery and the press. And then they added a community dark room. And wow. now this entire building is taken over by the Flower City Art Center, which is an outgrowth of, what, of these, oh, wow. these grassroots organizations. Yeah. Uh, on the left hand side, it says the regular restaurant, and then on the right hand side, it says in those funky letters the Genesee Co op. So, this was a food cooperative. It was like a little Ithaca right there. <laughs> <laughs> and you probably saw this it says Gay Alliance, side alley. So, to get to the Gay Alliance, you would actually have to go over here, past this fence. And then you'd have to walk into a door up a flight of stairs, and that's where the gay community center was. Wow. That was the first location. Where, at the, where at is the it located station. in Rochester? Uh, this was on Monroe Avenue, uh, and it's just outside of this, uh, just outside of downtown. Because huh. um, I'm wondering if we had a meeting there one time. You might have, yeah. Uh, the group that I have been with in Rochester chose a place, and I, yeah. you know, I had to take my. <laughs> find it sure <laughs> uh, yeah this, and this is before map. MapQuest <laughs> or yeah. google maps you know so yeah it was really quite quite the space um and you know here's like an advertisement that was in the empty closet for a coffee house there and we were looking at this very hippie space <laughs> that the gay community gay, the gay alliance moved into um it was upstairs you had to go down that uh, alley on the left and these are the different uh things that are there and the the pottery and the press are still there and the community darkroom started at this time. Uh, and all three of those things are now the Flower City Art Center. And they have, I've actually taught photography at this oh, space, wow. which is pretty cool. So, you know, they would have a coffee house. Um, the empty closet was still being done. And this is a more contemporary oh, image cool. of, of the space. It's two firehouses put together, which I'm is kind of cool. I'm going to by there and see if that's... Yeah. It yeah, might be the place, met, yeah. You know, are kind those of a coffee house kind of place. Round things, well, windows. Those are yeah, those are windows, and they almost look like really old picture frames. Yeah, they kind yeah. of like, which is kind of funky. You know, it's it's a very baroque building for our street. You know, even though I yeah. can't tell you, it's probably from the nineteen twenties. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. and they probably. built yeah. they built the one on the right hand side earlier because it's a little more weathered than the one on the left hand side, so and the one on the left hand side is just a little together. wider. Yeah. You can even see the the middle windows a little yeah. wider. Yeah. So it's just it's it's yeah. goofy that they're right next to each other like that. That's and and well, there's they actually two, had two fire engines. The, by yeah, they did, and they have two stairwells. <laughs> so oh. there's like a wall between them, which and then there's some doors that go they between. Should have thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> over the years, the community center decided that they didn't want to be sort of stuck in the back of this building, as cool and hippy as it was. Um, <laughs> And so they actually bought a space, and they bought a space on Elton Street at the okay. near um, at the corner of Elton and uh, Atlantic. Okay. And there was this other commercial building that has this sort of funny corner, and this is actually the opening of that. And you can see Sue Cowell there with her polka dot pants, and she's actually talking to Tim Maines with the round glasses behind 
her and the guy in the middle there is a guy named Bob who's holding the papers and he's my Facebook friend now, which is kind of cool. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a big deal. The, the Gay Community Center actually got their own space. Yeah. Now, one of the things that was a little tough uh, is that they were also trying to become a nonprofit. They were still just kind of like a club. And um, the, the city, which at that time was controlling nonprofits. Now it's in like New York state that controls nonprofits, but they weren't granting them a license. And uh, one of the things that, that, that happened in the, in the 1970s uh, was a grant from the U S government called CETA, C E T A. And the city was getting uh, money uh, from the, the federal government and distributing it, but they weren't going to give it to the gay community center. So this man who worked for the Urban League, an African-American organization, decided that he would be the fiduciary person to get the, this grant of federal funding for this organization. And that man, William Johnson, later became mayor of the city of Rochester, oh, yeah. which is super cool. So they were able to, they actually did go to court about the nonprofit and the woman who argued on behalf of the Gay Alliance is now a judge, Ellen Yaknin. So she's so that's a pretty cool thing. She's a lesbian, uh, and is it's really a cool thing. So so two really important things happened right at the start of late late seventies, early eighties. Of course, AIDS became something you know really big, and there were all, all sorts of group meetings, and and these were definitely marches and not parades. Yeah. The AIDS quilt came to town. Um, it was a it was a thing, and the different organizations uh, popped up. AIDS Rochester, which Sue ran, Community Health Network, which Dr. Valenti ran, and they merged to become AIDS Care, and then they became Trillium Health, and that's where I go for oh, my care. Interesting. Yeah, and it's 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 moved a little bit from being uh, uh, just serving LGBT people to uh, more of a a whole community, everybody, everybody yeah. you know, and it's it's great. They've even opened a pediatric and a gynecological office, which is kind of cool. Absolutely important. It's mm -hmm. super important. So I want to talk about Tim, this guy with this crazy hair, Tim Maines. Uh, he became a teacher. He became known as the gay teacher, and he also ran for city council, and he won, and he was one of the very first elected uh, gay people in all of New York State wow. in, at Rochester City Council. Uh, here he is uh, just a couple years ago. Uh, he has since passed away. He died of a heart attack. But he became a, a superintendent of schools. Uh, after, I remember that. Yeah, 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 he was a great guy. Uh, after he finished his tenure on the city council, he was followed by two other gay guys who served a couple of terms, which is pretty cool. So, um, you know, in that Elton Street Center, we went through a whole bunch of different executive directors, but there was always this collection of books. The books moved from all these places. They moved from Todd Union, from the GLF bookshelf, over to, I think the women kept the books, <laughs> over to the, the, the firehouse. Yeah. And then they moved over to um, Elton Street, to the, the community center. And it was kind of like this, mm -hmm. in that it was just a wall of books. And... It was kind of a checkout system that was on your honor. And some people forgot to bring books back. <laughs> and, you know, that's okay. Um, you know, maybe they really needed them, you know. Um, but, um, yeah. Uh, we had an uh, executive director who decided that it would be cool to move into this building. This Whoa. is like two buildings next to each other. And for a while, this was the Masonic Temple in Rochester. And on the left-hand side is this massive theater, the Auditorium Center Theater, or the Auditorium Theater, and that's where all the Broadway shows come, yeah. and where a lot of pop singers will perform there. They have a theater organ in there, and they do theater organ concerts. Eastman students just perform there on April 2nd, which is pretty cool. And on the right-hand side, it was all of these different uh, spaces. You can see there's kind of weird, irregular windows. They were all the Masonic meeting rooms. Mm -hmm. And we had an executive director. He was a Southern guy. Chuck Bowen, who decided that we should move over to this building. But they moved up to the fifth floor. Mm -hmm. oh, no elevators. Well, there was an elevator. No, you're right. There wasn't an elevator. The elevator was broken. So, yes, it was a drag to have to go up there. And it wasn't, it, it just wasn't, I don't know what he was thinking. 
Well, no, nobody would it. come if they knew they had to walk up five, five flights. flights right. Nobody did come. So they, they still own the building on Elton Street, and we kept the library there for like two or three years. Mm -hmm. And then they finally sold it, and we had to move into this space. And, you know, we, we were in like four different locations in this building, and the library just kept uh, getting larger and larger. It was kind of like this, and it just got, you know, oh, this is bigger. We, we need like four or five shelves or, you know. And then we, we started taking care of uh, the empty closet, uh, which had been saved mm -hmm. in folders. Like, you know, these are all, and it, this is all acid neutral paper. These are all things that were saved, you know. And there was just, just, you know, every library has stuff in a box. We had so much stuff in a box. Um, but we also had, a, a, in this building, we had a kind of a nice space. And uh, the Rochester Regional Library Council came over and looked at our space and said, we were like, oh, could we be like a junior member? And they're like, no, you're like a real library. <laughs> and we're like, we are. We are. <laughs> and, and we became members of the Rochester Regional Library Council, which we still are. Wow. And we had like a, a banner. Here we are Very with a, an interim executive director. Mm -hmm. And we marched in, in, in a, a pride parade with, huh. with our own shirts. And, wow. You know, that is cool. It was cool. It was cool. Yeah. It, and, you know. How long ago was that, Jerry? This is probably maybe like seven, eight years ago, you know. Oh. Um, and I wanted, I wanted to mention the film festival again because um, this is an old picture of the old marquee at the Little Theater. Uh, they were showing other movies. Um, I think, Master and robot, you know, <laughs> those are like, you know, master what? Robot what? Um, but, you know, here's the thing from the 30th anniversary festival. Uh, I wanted to, to let you know that I've been a, uh, a sponsor and the library has been a sponsor of their archival films mm. for the past 15 years or so. And so I will actually bring in something that's connected to the movie. Like this was a movie about James Dean, I think starred James Franco. And so there was this biography about James Dean, and so I brought it over, and I talked about our collection in front of a, cr a crowd of people, mm -hmm. and I showed them, I always have a show and tell thing, just like I have tonight, you know, these zoo animals, if you will. <laughs> but one of the things you should realize is that the film festival actually generates a uh, literary journal, huh. and there have been, I think, seven of them. Wow. And so we have all of these in our collection. So... Here are these institutions that are in town that are creating print items. The uh -huh. agency itself creating this monthly magazine newspaper for years. <laughs> Here's the film festival creating this literary journal. And, you know, so that we have this connection. And here I am representing the library on the stage of the festival, which is cool. And it's usually always a movie at the Dryden Theater at the George Eastman Museum. So I've spoken at the podium. You know, they, they show a, usually a movie on film. You know, one time it was Hed a 10-year anniversary of Hedwig and the Angry Inch. And that was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, th so it's, it's just kind of a cool thing to have this relationship with this other large-scale organization in town. Um, I wanted to tell you about this lady, Evelyn Bailey. She was never on the board of the Alliance, but she was a driving force uh, with this. Um, she created the Shoulders to Stand On video documentary. And here's Karen Hagberg, that lady with the pianos, my neighbor, uh, in this Shoulders to Stand On documentary. And I'm actually in this documentary for a, a minute. <laughs> I'm a talking head in a documentary. It's been almost 10 years since this was out. And um, Evelyn... Uh, started to interview people, either audio interviews or video interviews in a situation like this. And we would talk for like a half an hour and then they would, they took what we did, we said and cut it up into different parts to match the subject of that section of the mm -hmm. thing. It was about going out to gay bars or about drag queens or about, you know, the picnic or the parade or what, whatever. Like a, a lot of these topics I've been mentioning, you know, wow. if we said something about it, it was sort of inserted. It, it, there was no narrator. It was just jumping around between what we were saying. Well, in the process of doing this, she started to collect a lot of uh, personal effects and archival material from all of these different people. And so she started to place these into actual uh, institutional repositories. Um, part of it uh, generated the Anthony Nationally Rainbow Dialogues, which was a talk about archival materials that mostly are held at the Rochester Public Library. Uh, part of it was uh, this, which I was part of, which are these giant panels. They're like about as big as that door that are vinyl. Each one of these is about a different aspect of Rochester gay history. Uh, and they so sort of tell each of those panels is door size? Yeah. 
Yeah, we, we have to hang them up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, these, these were actually borrowed by Monroe County last year during the Pride Festival, and they were put around the county because we have a Democratic county legislator, yeah. uh, when, executive. When that, Before, yeah. our Republican ones wouldn't even let people uh, fly Pride flags. So that's not so great. So here's, here's a little bit closer of one of the panels of all the different bars. Yeah. And, you know, moving over to the Auditorium Center, marriage it. equality, that kind of thing. So here's Evelyn at, at, at the county building, uh, and this is she's there in the wheelchair. She she got pancreatic cancer, and she died in mid July of 2022. But a month before she passed away, uh, they had an Evelyn Bailey Day at the county building, and all these folks were there. And I was not there because I was taking this picture from the you second floor balcony. But I was I was I was not in the picture. But I'm up there. Um, since then, uh, the Rochester Public Library has announced. Uh, this um, mm -hmm. foundation and this fund to fund someone to take care of the LGBT collection at the Rochester Public Library. Mm -hmm. But as I said before, the U of R also has been a great partner with our our history. And, you know, a lot of this stuff is print stuff. It's like, you know, some of it's more primary source, some of it's more like mass produced, like these things are mass produced. But the, there's this empty closet digital archive that's at the U of R, and that's pretty mm -hmm. cool. And then some of our things went to Cornell University, which has this rare and manuscript collection at the Crotch Library, K-R-O-C-H. <laughs> I know. Sure. I know. <laughs> yeah, but it's a very, very large collection. So it's, a, it's at a private institution, and it's actually off-site. So it's not, and it's not really a, like a browsable collection. You can certainly look in their catalog and stuff. But, but one of the great things about the books on the wall that has grown into our library is that almost everything circulates, like, you know, 80% of the stuff circulates. And so uh, we moved out of the Auditorium Center to a space that was on the street level uh, on one, one here College Avenue, which is pretty cool. And um, this is what the library looked like there. Um, and of course, this is actually during the pandemic when there weren't any people. But as you, <laughs> but as you can see, it's a lot of, it's it's a lot lot of books and a lot of materials. We have over 10,000 books now. Mm. Now, is your library connected to the other <clears throat> libraries? Like online? Mm -hmm. It's not. We have our own library catalog. We use Library Thing. For a while, they were charging institutions $15 to put as many books as you wanted. And so we did. And then later, they decided to make it free for everyone. But $15 for a year is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, every, every book that you see here and here and here and all these DVDs and videos, all of these are in our library catalog wow. with like a bibliographic record. And all, most of them have tags as well. And you <coughs> touched every one. Oh, yes. <laughs> I have. Times. Were most of these books purchased? By <coughs> no. Almost all donated? of them were donated. Wow. So a very small amount were sent to us by publishers. Mm -hmm. uh, they were sent to the Empty Closet Editor for maybe a review, a book review, and some of them got reviewed, but a lot of them just came right to us, and we put them in our collection. So we did get a bunch of newer books that way, hmm. like just literally hot off the press. It would almost always come with a piece of paper that showed, you know, like insert, you know, a little blurb, a little press release, if you will. Wow. But, you know, that was like maybe 10 books a year, whereas everything else is donation. Do you have things like DVDs and movies and things yeah. like that too? These are all DVDs. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, they're all DVDs. Mm -hmm. Plus, we have since gotten dozens and dozens of DVDs. Good. Wow. We weren't sure how to put the DVDs on the shelf because we just, we didn't, you know, the books are in order by subject if they're nonfiction and by author if they're fiction. Um, but it was like, okay, what do we do? You know, um, so we just decided to give them a session ordering. So they have an A through Z and then after that last Z, then they're just sort of random, random as mm -hmm. we add them. Mm -hmm. But we have, I think, over a thousand of those. So that's pretty cool. Um, do you have a DVD player? We do, and we have a VHS player too because we have VHSs. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here are our rare books. Uh, these are things, again, not before 1975. Or if we look in WorldCat to see if this is a, a rare book, it has like, oh, it's only in two libraries in the whole world. That's rare. We should keep that. Yeah. You know, again, a lot of it is, is, is we, libraries weeding, libraries not keeping older editions of things. Um, 
Academic libraries keep older, older things because they know they're useful, but public libraries don't, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where we put more sexy stuff. One of the things that, you know, has happened is, is that after Stonewall, there was this flowering of folks able to express their sexuality. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that was expressed through print media. Either sexy pictures or sexy stories, like very sexy stories. You know. But you know, <laughs> you know, the things that you see here are mostly sexy picture things. You know, um, so it's like the art books. And yes, they're like definitely that. art books. A lot of these are art books, uh, and so you know, they just go into the rare section. So and they're in our catalog, so people can see and they see that they're rare, and they can certainly look at them. But we don't circulate them, and we keep them separate. Um, so this is. <laughs> Only half of the filing cabinets that we have of rare materials. And it's not archival materials. It's, it's things that were produced en masse. It's not primary source materials, in other words. It's not letters, documents, business meetings, you know. Mm -hmm. wow. it's, it's all stuff that's been out there, but it's in very small quantities, maybe. Mm -hmm. These racks are filled with magazine boxes and filled with magazines. These are just like regular magazines that have an LGBT connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... So this was great. We were in this space for you know quite a few years, and then our landlord last year in May, uh, maybe June, told us that they were not renewing our lease. Oh no! And we had to be out of there by August thirty first. Oh, what a nightmare! Oh my god! And so the the board had just come on in May of that year, and so they just within like a month and a half they had to find a new place for us. And so they were looking all over town, and it just so happens that literally down the street at the former Red Cross building, there was this space. And when I walked into it, I was like, oh, OMG. Yeah. this is great. And this, this isn't even with the lights on, really. <laughs> this is what it looks like with the lights on. That's how bright it is. That's me putting paper on the floor to plan to move the library. We got volunteers. This is what this is how we spent my summer vacation. This is how I spent my this is how I spent my August my August mm -hmm. moving these things. Here's the very first shelf that we took off of books. The DVDs are on the left hand side. What we did is we took all the books off the shelf, put them in boxes in, in a no, numerical like a numbered box, one through thirteen I think. Took the shelves off so we could move it because <laughs> they're heavy. And then we actually put these on our new shelf, but this is what was there. And what we did was we were able to move every single shelf at a time. Wow. So all the books went back onto a shelf immediately. And how much, how long did we, that? It took three weeks. Oh, oh, three? Yeah, three, three weeks. Yeah, three, you know, of, of, of a couple, uh, like three times a week. Like Sunday afternoon for f like three or four hours, like Wednesday night. You know, Thursday night, whatever. Yeah. Here's some of the folks who helped out. Uh, so there's Andrew, our, our president. Here's Margaret, uh, Casey, and Luke. Here's one of the shelves out on the street <laughs> before we moved it. Here's the moving truck. Here's the old center moving things out. Here's the new center uh, holding books in boxes to go onto the shelf. Um, here's, a, here's a bunch of folks who helped uh, one, one day, which was pretty cool. Um, and then here are some photographs, uh, like a little collage of all the different shelves of the wow. books that were there. So, yeah, it was wow. kind of miraculous. I think only one or two shelves got uh, out of order. And it was just like they were part of the same unit, you know, and I just had to go, okay, these like, go here. Yeah, yeah. So it's not like, you know, when we had just, moved, we, awesome. yeah. When we had moved it before, we had to pack all the books up into boxes mm -hmm. and number every box. And then the movers move them. Mm -hmm. And when they move them the last time, they put box number one on the bottom of the pile. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I want to show you, like, you know, what are some of the things like, like, that we have? So here is a, a, a CD, the Age Cult Songbook, wow. uh, with all these different composers. Uh, I'm curious. What's, yeah. it, what's in the songbook? Um, it is. Um, well, it's every one of these people uh, wrote... Uh, uh, some some sort of song, either yeah. to a pre-existing text or to a new text. And it's folks like William Balcom, who is not gay, but is a great composer, married to Joan. Um, they, they, have you ever heard that song, Lime Jello, Marshmallow, Cottage Cheese Surprise? He wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Elizabeth Brown, Carl that. Byron, Crystal Blasier, Ricky Ian Gordon, who's still composing and composing oh. operas, and has written things for like Julia Bullock to sing, 
uh, Nicole uh, Cavell, uh, John Harbison, uh, Fred Hirsch, a, j a gay jazz uh, mm -hmm. performer who I, I've met a few times. He's come to Eastman to perform and also at our jazz festival. Uh, Lee Hoiby, who was an Eastman grad, who wrote uh, an opera called uh, uh, When the Rill Sings, it's like a bird, and they've done that at Eastman a couple times. Uh, David Krakauer, Ania Lockwood, John Musto, Ned Roram, who just mm -hmm. died recently at age 98 or 99, and uh, was the lover of, uh, was he Minotti's lover? I don't know, but he lived a really long time. Uh, which is kind of amazing. Donald St. Pierre, Richard Thomas, not the Richard so Thomas. So are those know. songs yeah. related to the squares in the quilt? I, I, I think they were just related to HIV and AIDS. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, some of them may be a, a bit about a particular person. Uh, and uh, and then these are the different performers. William Sharp, Sanford Sylvan. He per, he was the first Nixon in, uh, John Adams Nixon in China, that opera uh, back in the 1980s. So yeah. Here's like a self-help book for gay guys, <laughs> yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And here's a, a sort of a sexy, whenever a book is by Anonymous, then you know it's gonna be like a sexy book. So it's a little pocket book. <laughs> but, so I just, I should, but I wanted to, I brought a couple things off the shelf, you know, uh, in the drawer. So we have, uh, we, in, in our DVDs, we have feature films, we have collections of shorts, and we also have documentaries. So I don't know if you've ever seen this. This is a really great movie, For the Bible Tells Me So. Uh, really wonderful, and and this is Dick Gephardt, who was a uh, politician who has a lesbian daughter, and so it was. It, it's this, he was interviewed in here, and it was a really kind of a cool thing. Mm -hmm. um, wow. We also have uh, a whole bunch of VHS tapes. You know, the thing about this is a French movie, Je Suis, and it, the English title is Heads or Tails. I'm like, no, that means I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm like, okay. Have you never taken French? Huh. No. So. Um, it's, uh, the thing about a lot of gay stuff is that it's very small press often, and so you know this you is like a little it. indie movie, and it's probably never been released on DVD. No. It might not be streaming, no. and you know we we keep these things because they are gay culture, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, this you could probably stream on, you know, Hulu or Netflix. Uh, because it's so, it was a really yeah. big deal documentary. But this, you know, it's like this little blip of a film, you know, this little French sexy comedy. And who knows? Wow. We have like hundreds of VHS tapes of things that have never been released on DVD. Mm -hmm. And we have to keep them because you know, yeah. they're really important to kind Can of you document. make DVDs out of them? We can't really because uh, of copyright. Oh, um. You know. So that it would require figuring out a way to get permission to do that. Yes. So we'd have and to contact... Terrible. Yeah, we're, we're, if they still exist. distributed exclusively in Canada by Mallow Film. <laughs> it's, all, which, it's from a whole other country. Which has been the phone for yeah, the yeah, probably that. Yeah. yeah, so one of the uh, things that Alex has done here with the library is, uh, when our group started, uh, probably every month he would find a film to try and show. Oh yeah, and uh, some of them were very interesting. There was one about a couple girls and. The Middle East, who sort of got wrapped up with the morality police. Oh, yeah, yeah. And one of them got stuck there and had to marry a, a guy. Yeah. And the other one escaped and managed to get to the States, where I think she went to UCLA or something. Okay, wow. Uh, another one was about a college professor who w was in a secret relationship with a friend. He was older. Okay. And his friend died. Oh. And um, he was about to commit suicide. Uh, and oh, is that the one band? of his students yeah. figured it out yeah. and basically befriended him and prevented the suicide. Wow. Um, another, what was one of the others? Another was about a black girl who came out to her family in New York City. Um, and of course, they could not tolerate it. And she ended up leaving the family and went to the West Coast and became a pretty good poet. Yeah. Um, Another one that they showed at the, there was always a, a set of, well, let me put it this way. I used to go to the American Academy of Child Psychiatry meetings all the time. And one of the things that you could do for credit was what they called media theater. Okay. They'd show a movie, discuss it, and you'd get continuing education credit. Wow. And rather than <laughs> sitting in some boring lecture. Yeah. lecture. <laughs> and uh, I remember one of them, one, a couple years they were showing Swan Lake. 
uh, but with a male dance oh, yeah. course. Yes, there that is. Was very yeah, interesting. There is and, that. There's that group. There's been a documentary yeah. recently about that group. Uh, um, I can't remember what they're called. Um, the dance troupe. The it's a it's a male the, dance troupe yeah. that will dance both male and female roles. But they made the point that the, the, they made the point that the ballet was not about the swan. Yeah, it's yeah. about the prince. It's about the prince. The yeah. prince is the. <laughs> uh, you know, his mother had told him he should yeah. get married. I'm trying to think what that the, what that group is called. The, they're the called the Flying Trocaderos. Oh, cool. And it's named after the Trocadero Ballet in Paris. Yeah. Uh, and there's the Palais de Trocadero, which is near the Eiffel Tower. They're called, yeah, there's a documentary about them, and it's really pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. It's very, very wonderful. Wow. And lots of clips of them dancing. So and, yeah. Another one was about a little boy who was probably uh, 12, 11 or 12, um, but was trans. And about the difficulty his yeah. family had in trying to figure this out and yeah. deal with it, and they ended up getting into therapy and, and did fine. But yeah, uh, that one was in I think French, Ma Vie en Rose. Oh yeah, I know uh, about that. In fact, I think we actually have a copy of we have a copy of that. Too. Yeah, yeah, that was great. That kid is, you know, no, je n'ai rien. He was like Edith Piaf in yeah. in the Flash. It's like, that's were, a great little movie. Yeah, there are a yeah. lot of very interesting yeah. movies out there, and and we'd like to get our movie series going again. But uh, we got a zillion DVDs for you to come. <laughs> I'll, br I'll bring them down. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the films that we have are, are things that were shown at our film festival. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, our, our recently departed uh, film programmer would go to Berlin and it was part of the jury of the gay part of the Berlin Film Festival. Yeah. And so he would be able to get us all of these super wild movies. One of the more mainstream movies that he got was actually nominated for an, a couple Academy Awards this last cycle. Uh, as an animated film, as a and as a foreign film, it was about an Iraqi guy who was gay, and it's called like it is, it's like pulse or press or something. It's like it's like one word, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was really, really an amazing movie, uh, and just very stunning. Uh, it was like a graphic novel on the screen, you know, mm -hmm. and it was nominated for a couple of different Academy Awards as both. That that country's entry for that award, as well as best animated feature, and it was about you know a gay person who was living under duress, you know, oh, yeah. and was able to escape. Mm -hmm. So we do have a, a large CD collection. This is actually a more recent one. Uh, here's Benjamin Britten's uh, "Holy Silence of John Donne" and a bunch of other folk songs and things. And oh, Britten was, of course, was a gay guy with his uh, partner Peter Pears. Um, and this is a more recent recording, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, this singer, Mark Padmore, also has recently performed in uh, Billy Budd, uh, mm -hmm. Benjamin Britten's opera based on Herman Neville's uh, short story. So we have a whole bunch of CDs of classical oh, music classical. as well as pop music. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's pretty cool. Can I see yeah. that one for a second? Yeah, yeah. We have local authors. I don't know if you know who Georgia oh, Beers is, but she lives in Rochester, and she's written a whole bunch of lesbian uh, romances, and we have almost all of them, and we have multiple copies of some of them. So this is a sort of a recentish one. This is called Snow Globe. There she is with her cat. So she's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, she's also very involved with the film festival. She's on the programming committee, and she helps to write some of the blurbs for the movies. So yeah, so oh. we have so many lesbian romances oh. and lesbian mystery stories. I think uh, the the most unique one is about a lesbian large animal veterinarian who's also a detective in Wyoming, <laughs> 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 which is pretty cool, you know. Um, here's uh, the, one of the image out. Uh, uh, this is volume six. This is one of their literary magazines. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They've had a couple different mm -hmm. editors, uh, which Can is I great. Yeah, totally. Thank you. And then I want to let you know that we have a pretty large collection of pulp fiction novels. <laughs> and we don't, we don't have, they're, they're almost all pocket books. We don't have them on the shelf in the rare section. We actually have them in the file drawers. We, and we have a folder that has like maybe two of them. And we put the titles. They're in t title order. So this is one called The Tormented. Yay. Love's Outcast. Here is a bold Frank novel. Frank. Yes. Or, you know, about a man fighting a losing battle to achieve normality in love and marriage. 
of the girl he married to prove his manhood, of the street girl he took to Paris to help him find emotional stability, the men he met who exploited his weaknesses, and the lonely conflicts of people caught in the web of abnormal desire. So even if the story itself was uh, uh, like a gay positive story, a lot of times these cover and the cover blurbs were very lurid. They often spoke of like another world, uh, like a, a, a secret world, uh, a demi-monde, as the French would say, you know, like the, that sort of half world of, uh, of, of the courtesan, you know, that you see in Moulin Rouge or you see in La Traviata. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a surging novel of forbidden love, you know. And that's how these were marketed. And, you know, these, this was owned by W.F. McKay, R.N., and it says his license number is there, so I guess I could look him up. Oh, wow. But you know, I love this. The fore edge and the top edges are are, are green. That or phone number. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, this was thirty five cents. These, say, oh, yeah. Yeah. Cents. yeah, this would have been like at a a newsstand, like on the bottom I shelf, did, yeah. underneath. You know, <laughs> the newsies knew what people wanted, and if if a guy yeah. would come up and they would wrap it in a newspaper. Or they would put it in another magazine, you know, oh, the Wall so Street, the Wall Street Journal, seen. so it wouldn't be seen. These were the kinds of things that were stuck between the so mattress. How, how far back is it? I think the once we have go back to the late nineteen forties, huh. which is pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, this is an this is one. Uh, I, I got to tell you, sometimes the publication information on these is not super great. This is from nineteen fifty five. This one was published in June nineteen fifty six. And it was published by the Popular Library. This is actually a little bit more legit. Um, and as we started to move into the 70s, as some of the laws about uh, nudity and pornography changed, uh, you start to see the covers become much more pornographic, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times the titles of, of, the, of the Pulp Fiction novels were kind of spoofs on other other titles, just the, like the way that porn movies titles were spoofs on things, mm -hmm. you know. And they were just, they're just so goofy, you know. And there, there's lots of things like tea room trade, you know, great. Um, you know, it's, yeah, yeah, very much so. There, there's, no, there's no sort of subtlety about them. But I'll tell you, an author like Patricia Highsmith, who wrote the series of novels uh, based on that character that they made in the movie, the talented Mr. Ripley, Mr. Ripley oh, yeah. is a character. Yeah, yeah. She wrote a, a lesbian novel called The Price of Salt, and she wrote it under, under a pen name, and it was in these type of lurid paperbacks. And now you can buy like a a nice, like a penguin edition of The Price of Salt. So you know, uh, the Wall of Loneliness also changed. turned like you know they were they would sort of reprint things that were slightly sexy or or had something to do with, you know, what was thought of as deviant sexuality. But they would put it, they would package it like it was this, you know, even though it was pretty boring. You know, it's kind of funny. So, as you probably know, we're living through kind of a rough time. Mm, yeah. yeah. Here's a here's a thing from two years ago. You know, this is, or you know, this is from a year ago. So this is from April fourth, twenty twenty two. So just a year ago, books about LGBT and you know, Black people are one of the most challenged books in twenty twenty one, and of course, it's only gotten worse since. You know, folks like Ron DeSantis who are, are, are putting people in charge of school boards and people who don't know anything about books are, are going in and clearing out libraries and especially uh, LGBT stuff. And uh, I think the most egregious thing is what happened in Michigan where a public library was was uh, defunded. Uh, it was actually, uh, they were like, the, the administration sort of censured the librarians and said, you know, uh, you need to get rid of this LGBT stuff especially this book called Gender Queer, which is a graphic novel. And they actually put it to a vote twice to the town. Like people actually got to vote yes or no to fund the library. And it got voted down twice. And I think wow. the library is actually closed now. Wow. Uh, because we had our they library money. vote yeah. today. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. It's ending now. Oh, boy. It's ended. Okay. Funding the library. Yeah. So this is another reason which, why I was not keen on our collection moving to the Rochester Public Library. Mm -hmm. Right now, Rochester has a Democratic mayor and administration and a Democratic city council. And we are super lucky for the past few years to have a Democratic county executive, even though the legislature is slightly Republican majority in, in, the, in Monroe County. Huh. 
And, you know, you think, oh, well, you know, the county legislatures, they don't care about the library. Well, we just had Cheryl Denolfo, and before that we had Maggie Brooks, who used to be a TV reporter. And um, she was very conservative, and she wanted to remove all the computers in all the Monroe County library systems because she said that people were looking at child pornography on them. So it was this, there was this dog whistle, and, wow. and she was bringing this forward to the legislature because she was a Republican. There was a Republican in the legislature. The way that the, the, the library system works in um, Monroe County is that it is a weird federated system. The person who is in charge of the central library, the main branch of the library, which is two buildings, many floors, different divisions and sections, they're also the head of the entire Monroe County library system, oh. which is made up of almost all the rest are town libraries. Mm -hmm. I think the only other city in, the, in Monroe County is East Rochester, and they have a library too. So, so it's like the Ogden Farmers Library. <laughs> you know, They're all part of this federated system. And they all share the same library catalog. They give things different call numbers, but they, they all share things. And, and you can also borrow things right. that circulate all the, the way queen. across it. Yes. It, so there's a very like active the Southern Tier movie. Library. System. Yes. It's just like that. So, but it's, what's weird is that the person who's in charge of the city library is also in charge of that system. And so far, we've had great people. The person that's there now, Patty Utaro, she and I went to library school together, so that we were in classes together. So she's now like the queen of the libraries, and I'm just a librarian at the Sibley Music Club. No, it's just fine. <laughs> she's great, but it's, we do have this cool connection because we took classes together. Thank goodness. Like in, you know, she's great, but you know, there could be someone in charge of that who's not that great. There could be another Republican. Um, county executive who wants to meddle with the libraries because they, the legislature, because of this weird federated system, the city libraries get money from the county because they're part of the county system. So, so yeah, there's this weirdness. In fact, I, I mentioned uh, our library, you know, reopening to a, a, a gay activist, and he said, "Is it connected to any government institution?" And I said, "No." He goes, "Thank God." Yeah. Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. Yeah. So, because this Absolutely. this this is what can happen. That's real. So it's here's 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 a that was from April, uh, you know, fourth, twenty twenty two. Here's a, an article from April 9th, twenty twenty three. So this year, some in Brookfield want to ban vulgar. This book is gay. Others say they're targeting LGBT books. And then, you know, and and these things were all happening in places that were far away, and then something it's happened. Getting closer. Really close. This is only 20 miles away from Rochester. This was two yeah. weeks ago. Oh, that's oh. why there was a bomb threat? Mm -hmm. yep. oh, there was a I bomb threat on that. a Wednesday and a bomb threat on a Friday. Yeah. That's crazy. It is crazy. and Because we, the book might jump out and do something yeah. to you. Well, it's, it, it kind of shows... Ignorance. Well, it sh it sh no, it, it doesn't show ignorance. It shows that they recognize the power of a book. Mm -hmm. That's it's it's mm -hmm. it's willful uh, pushing back against that. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so when this happened, someone donated another copy of this. This is this is this is it. I just, I haven't even added it to the catalog. Someone uh -huh. named Heather said, thank you for the good work you all do. This book is getting such negative attention, but it really is very good and has a valuable place in the LGBTQ community. Please accept this book and give it to someone who could use it. Keep on doing the good work. Heather. Nice. So wow. that this was the book that caused the story? Yes. Yes. When I was in high school, my English teacher got fired three times. I got hired back each time because he was such a good teacher. And I remember my parents would always say, oh, he shouldn't be having you read that book. It's terrible. Yeah. And my response was always, have you read it? And of course, they never They had never it. did. Never had it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we loved him. He was, he was wonderful. So. I think it's awesome. Yeah. You know? So this is, this is the book on the screen. This is the copy is right here. Amazing. Okay? This, this is the book that caused an entire school district, a central school, to close down two days last month in the Rochester area. Okay, so this is all bad news, but I wanted to share some good news. First of all, people are starting to fight back. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is in West Hollywood, I know, which is like a gay enclave. Yeah. But look, 
Thousands march against anti-LGBTQ plus bills. The, the whole drag queen thing in Tennessee, you know, you can't actually have drag shows without, that you could get arrested, you know? I mean, it's just really, it's really, really, really bad. Really bad. Well, Bobo yeah. dressed as a girl once or mm -hmm. twice. Yeah. Yeah, and Tony yeah. Curtis. Yeah, oh, oh and, yeah. Uh, I mean, Jack Lennon and Tony Curtis and, uh -huh. you know, yeah. Robin Williams. So, <laughs> people are starting to wake up and fight back, which is awesome. That's good. Okay. The second cool thing that happened is local. Here's Todd Union again, where the GLF started. Take heart, gay brothers. You know, it's now uh, going to be part of a historic historic place in New York State. This is from you know last week, you know, March twenty sixth. Okay. Wonderful. So and then now the Lilac Library, which is what we're calling it. You know. We're, we're, Why did you name Nashville? it that? Well. I, I wanted to call it the Lilac Athenaeum, but, <laughs> but you know, but it's because uh, Rochester has the Lilac Festival, it has, yeah, and Lilac yeah. is a color that's been associated with gay people for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we actually got uh, an article on the WXSI website as well as a radio article. Mm -hmm. uh, you can listen to you, and this is Maureen and I. We both did not coordinate our clothes. We just showed up. Yeah. <laughs> it was well, kind of funny. You kind of did. You're yeah. red, red and black. Yeah, red and black just... or a buffalo plaid. Yeah. So there yeah. we are. So she's a new board member. And as you can see, we have all those books in the background, those nonfiction yeah. books. And, of course, this library lecture, which I have this paperwork here. This is our sort of first event. It's happening next week on Wednesday night. And, boy, what a we're starting out with a bang. A lesbian... Jewish communist. <laughs> so, uh, with her book, Communists in Closets, Queering the History from the 1930s to the 1990s, right? Huh. So she's going to give a talk. We'll see who shows up. Uh, is, is this available online? I don't think it's going to be online. I think it's just going to be an in-person no, 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 thing. No, I mean, I mean oh. the flyer. Oh, yeah. It's on the Out Alliance uh, Facebook page. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that I brought a couple flyers for you to take. Okay, because so, I want to yeah. forward it to yeah. friends that were up there. Um, you could, the uh, I would say take a picture of it so with your phone. Or, yeah, or scan it, yeah. Scan it. So I wanted to go back to this this title about this, <laughs> this pages past hand to hand. Um, this you know this idea of sort of like a, almost like a secret literature that goes back and forth between people, and you know if you're in, if you know you know kind of a thing, you know. Um, and here's this here's the study of this literature. Between men, English literature and male homosocial desire. Uh, you know, here are these two guys having this conversation. You know, this might be a Manet or a Monet or a Degas, you know. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, and it's English literature. So it's based, it's looking at, you know, the printed word. So go back to Walt Whitman. Yeah. You know, our sort of proto-gay poet. Here's a I little, just found that out. Yeah. Yeah. We two We're boys, to, we two boys together clinging, one the other never leaving, up and down the roads going, north and south excursions making. You here's didn't know a, you were coming to a reading. Okay? <laughs> here, here's a Daguerre type of him, kind of rakish. Here's the first edition of Leaves of Grass. Here's yeah. the, the 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 engraved picture of him, which is taken from a Daguerre type, which has since been lost. But mm. there he is. Kind of, yeah, do you hey, have that book in your says, library? No. <laughs> we, well, we have a newer edition. And here's the, the what they call the Christ picture on Whitman. Whitman was so influential of so many people yeah. as the 19th century went on with his different editions of Lisa Grass. And one of the people that was really interested in Whitman was this guy who was kind of a weirdo, uh, but a cool guy. Edward Carpenter, he was one of the founders of the Labor Party. He, uh, he, he, even in the era of, uh, of uh, Oscar Wilde being put into prison, he lived a pretty openly gay life with his younger, more working class partner, who was still pretty, <laughs> right there. Mm -hmm. um, and they lived together. As, as, as they got older, they lived together for years and years and years. They lived mm -hmm. on a farm. He wore sandals <laughs> with socks. 